Good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for checking in with us again this this fine morning. Uh, so we are now at week five of the uh, AO Trauma North America uh, Internet Live um, Pelvic and Acetabular Fracture Management course. Um, I'm joined uh, today by uh, Stephen Sims, uh, who um, we are co-chairing this uh, this course. Uh, Dave Stephen is on call today, and so uh, not able to be with us, but uh, um, also has a major role in in putting this uh, course on. Uh, as you know, and you've heard over the last couple of weeks, uh, this uh, whole concept was uh, sort of born out of necessity from the pandemic. Uh, modeled after the first uh, online offering, which was the osteotomy course. Uh, and um, that was a successful eight-week uh, course. Uh, those, the links to that course are still available as, a, as an online course uh, through the AO, North America, AO Trauma North America YouTube channel. Uh, so anybody that's interested in checking that course out, uh, those are still available. Ideally, uh, this is a uh, hybrid uh, course uh, where this online component would be followed by a face-to-face -face component, uh, and that face-to-face -face, uh, component would involve the cadaveric dissections as well as time for uh, case discussions uh, in a in a face-to-face -face setting. Uh, the idea is that that would be held at the Equendo Center uh, in Las Vegas, um, and time to be determined. Uh, but uh, we do hope that. Um, uh, that people will be able to join us uh, if we're able to put that on. And uh, we uh, have decided to give preference to those who have registered for and, and attended uh, each of the week's um, uh, sections of the course. All of the lectures are recorded uh, and CME is offered for the, uh, for the offering. Uh, and uh, the AO Trauma North America YouTube channel is where all of the uh, components of this course, all of the lectures today, as well as previous weeks, as well as the homework that's assigned uh, between the weeks um, is uh, stored. Uh, we do, if there's any bright spot to the pandemic, it's been that uh, we've been able to uh, really have no limit on our selection of uh, faculty and uh, we have uh, assembled a really outstanding group of educators uh, who are available week to week uh, for uh, portions of this uh, course. Uh, and, um, you know, we're very thankful uh, that everybody was uh, able to join us for periods of time uh, for this program. So today, the uh, three main faculty members are, are going to be Dr. Keith Mayo from Seattle, Dr. Philip Krieger from Nashville, and Dr. Claude Saji from Cincinnati. Uh, and uh, together with myself, we'll be putting on, this is a, a tabular fracture evaluation and treatment, actually week two. Sorry, I didn't uh, edit that uh, from uh, the past uh, week. Uh, these are the disclosures for the uh, speakers uh, in uh, today's course, uh, and they're available uh, to you as well uh, to review live if you wish. So today, we're sort of sitting in between two main groups of topics. If you were here with us last week, uh, we discussed the radiology and classification of acetabular fractures, and then moved on to a discussion of posterior wall fractures and posterior column and posterior column plus posterior wall fractures. Today, we are going to discuss the transverse family of fractures. And so the learning objectives will be to understand the radiographic features of all of those family of fractures and then be able to determine the surgical approach and treatment options for the transverse, transverse posterior wall and T-shaped fractures. We're then gonna sum up the fractures considered the sort of posterior uh, group of fractures, if you will, and then move on to some of the more anterior based fractures with a discussion of the uh, uh, anterior interpelvic approach and ilioinguinal approach for use of acetabular fractures in terms of their anatomy, visualization, and utility, uh, and also discuss the relevant reduction and fixation techniques for both approaches. Right. Here's the, uh, the schedule for uh, today. Um, for in terms of uh, etiquette, uh, all of your microphones have been muted and video has been uh, turned off. Uh, please use the question and answer section uh, 
uh, to address either general questions to the faculty or specific questions uh, to the faculty member who's uh, speaking. Uh, and those will be uh, answered for you either by uh, faculty volunteering uh, today or uh, course faculty or the faculty uh, member who has been uh, giving the talk. We'll also take some questions uh, and present them live to the faculty uh, afterwards. So we're going to move into our uh, first speaker. That's uh, Phil Krieger from Nashville, and he is going to speak on the transverse and transverse posterior wall fractures radiology approach and treatment. Uh, greetings from Rosemary Beach, uh, Florida. I'm from Nashville. And my charge today is to talk about the transverse and transverse posterior wall uh, acetabular fractures. We're gonna talk a little bit on the radiology. We talked last week on the approach and then uh, talk a little bit um, about the uh, treatment. So my goals are really to have you understand the radiology of the transverse and transverse posterior wall acetabular fracture, understand the surgical tactics for reduction of the transverse fracture, and then have you remember what Eric Johnson from UCLA taught you last week about the posterior wall and combine that for the transverse posterior wall acetabular fracture. So the transverse fracture is an elementary fracture. It doesn't make it a simple fracture, but it was named elementary uh, by Professor Lertonel uh, because of the purity of the uh, fracture. So there is a typical transverse fracture. You see the one plane uh, fracture. And then if that is combined with a posterior wall, of course, we have a transverse posterior wall. And then Dr. Riley will talk to us uh, about the T-type uh, fracture where you have a vertical limb dissociating the anterior and posterior components of the uh, ischiopubic segment. So the transverse fracture is a pure line fracture. And here is a radiographic depiction of it. In the CT scan, we oftentimes see the simple anterior to posterior uh, uh, transverse uh, nature of the fracture. And in the bottom right there, a typical transverse or so-called transtectal transverse fracture. Because we really uh, further subcategorize the transverse fracture into an infratectal or below the top of the cotyloid fossa, a juxtatectal or right at the top of the cotyloid fossa, and a transtectal or right through the articular roof of the acetabulum. Whenever you see a transverse fracture, I like to ask myself, am I sure it's just a transverse fracture? And what do I mean by that? Is there a posterior wall? And we oftentimes can miss that in the AP plane. Uh, so you wanna look on the obturator oblique view. And then we also ask, is there a split between the two columns of the ischiopubic segment and Dr. Riley will talk about that. So the transverse with posterior wall fracture is of course uh, the transverse fracture with an accompanying uh, posterior wall. As we evolve into the surgical treatment, when we think about the surgical approach options for the transverse, we have a standard uh, Coker-Langenbeck approach which is used in the, in the majority of cases, occasionally, especially when combined with, uh, number one, um, some uh, pelvic ring pathology, or number two, some soft tissue concerns posteriorly, we may use an ilioinguinal approach. And occasionally we might utilize an extended iliofemoral approach, usually when the fracture is combined with some uh, sacral or uh, uh, sacroiliac joint uh, disruption. When we talk about the transverse with posterior wall, we know usually with the posterior wall, we're going to need to be posterior. And so even in the, in the far majority of cases, we're gonna utilize the standard Coker-Langebeck approach for the transverse with posterior wall. But occasionally, again, if there is a associated pelvic ring injury, we might utilize the ilioinguinal followed by the Coker-Langebeck for treatment of the posterior wall and a very rarely the extended iliofemoral approach. I think most of the faculty for the transverse or transverse with posterior wall 
uh, in terms of the Coker Langenbeck would uh, utilize the prone positioning as opposed to lateral positioning, although this is certainly debatable. It aids in reduction of the ischiopubic segment. It allows the surgeon to really palpate uh, through the greater sciatic notch, the quadrilateral surface. It allows for clamp placement through the greater sciatic notch and a very small aside, but it allows for an easier prep and drape. So this is the classic picture from the Jude uh, table. Uh, and just to remember from last week, what we can uh, actually direct visualize is in the purple there. And we can also palpate uh, through the greater sciatic notch and actually place clamp clamps through the greater sciatic notch in the red area there. How do we reduce the transverse fracture through the Coker Langenbeck? I think distal femoral traction can be very helpful. We can distract the hip joint and look inside the hip joint, particularly if we want to We can utilize an ischial tuberosity shans pin in the uh, great in the uh, ischial tuberosity. We can place angled jaw clamps through the greater sciatic notch or utilize a Weber clamp or Weber clamp. And we can also use screw to screw clamps or a small pelvic reduction clamp. So this is a schematic through Professor Letanel's book. Uh, through the greater sciatic notch, we can palpate the transverse fracture. We can utilize screw to screw clamps we can utilize an ischial tuberosity chance pin. This is another schematic. It happens to be uh, the three uh, entities that I utilize uh, most commonly for the transverse fracture. There you see a chance pin in the ischial tuberosity. You see a screw to screw clamp and you see a short angled jaw forcep through the greater sciatic notch uh, and onto the anterior aspect of the transverse fracture. A sawbone model of the exact same setup. There you see utilizing it for a reduction and fixation of a transverse posterior wall. There's a close up with a lag screw placed across the posterior aspect of the transverse fracture. So just a couple of case examples to kind of show you uh, how this might be utilized in a transverse with posterior wall. This is an irreducible uh, transverse with posterior wall fracture. You see the posterior wall there. This is in a 16 year old uh, Allstate track star. There you see an attempt at reduction, which is not successful. And the reason is because the femoral head is in fact a buttonhole through the short external rotators, as I will show you. This is the CT scan after an attempt at closed reduction. And this is the intraoperative photo. This is what we should be able to see through the Coker Langenbeck. And you see there the femoral head is buttonholed between the piriformis and the obturator internus and the accompanying gemelli or the so-called so conjoint tendon. If you ever want to know why the sciatic nerve is oftentimes bruised, here's a good example of that. You see also, as we talked about last week, that unmistakably the sciatic nerve is always on the posterior border of the quadratus. Here's the type of visualization in the same case after we release the external rotators uh, we can see, uh, in fact, the transverse fracture. The posterior wall fracture has been reflected uh, superiorly. The patient's head is to your right. The patient's feet is to your left. And there you see the transverse plane. This is the type of reduction. This is the type of visualization that is needed for an appropriate uh, reduction, as you see here. Now, what makes the transverse fracture more complicated? These are this is a really important slide because I think it can save you literally hours in the operating room. If you have an ipsilateral SI joint injury, 
if you have a sacral fracture, either uh, ipsilateral or contralateral, if you have anterior ring pathology or a symphysis disruption, and if you have the transtectal pattern. So here's an example of why we might utilize an ilioinguinal for a transverse fracture. This is a transverse fracture with accompanying pelvic ring pathology. This is the situation, and if you look at that, you obviously see a transverse family fracture. Of course, we're gonna be asking, as we already talked about, is there a posterior wall? Is there a vertical limb? But if you then look to the posterior ring, you can see, uh, even on this AP radiograph, a uh, left sacroiliac joint disruption, and also you'll notice that the right iliac wing is externally rotated in this pretty good AP pelvis. And so we have a situation of a bilateral SI joint injury. So here's a reconstruction view of the CAT scan showing you that in the immediate uh, uh, period. There's a 3D rendering showing you that there is no uh, posterior wall fracture in this case. And this is the uh, patient in traction after uh, she had an emergent uh, splenectomy. And in this particular case, you can uh, certainly debate this for a long time, uh, but I made the, uh, the operative uh, choice uh, in this patient who had a BMI of 45 and who had significant posterior road rash to do an open approach of both uh, SI joints. Here you see on the left side, the open approach with uh, two plates and then an iliosacral screw for added stability. And then a, through an ilioinguinal approach, uh, a reduction and fixation. This is challenging. The typical uh, problem is a slight peripheral gapping of the transverse fracture uh, posteriorly. There's the initial post-operative uh, situation after a direct anterior approach to both SI joints and an anterior approach of the transverse fracture. You see a slight uh, peripheral gapping as I've talked about. There you see the reduction in the two Jude films. And fortunately, this uh, patient has gone back at one year. She's actually followed by another member of the faculty in another city, but she's lost uh, a significant amount of weight, 55 pounds, uh, is now running, and uh, I think a reasonable result for the pretty complex injury. So the extended iliofemoral can be reserved in uh, severely delayed cases greater than two and a half to three weeks. The transtectal uh, variant uh, was historically um, ascertained by uh, Professor Lertinel to need the extended iliofemoral, although I think that's rarely used for a simple transtectal transverse in today's world, and also a significantly uh, a significant uh, sacroiliac joint uh, disruption on the same side as the transverse fracture. I won't belabor the anatomical details of a very complex approach, but this is a transtectal transverse in a 16-year-old uh, male, and you see a very high involvement of the notch. Uh, this was done about 22 years ago by myself, and you see an appropriate uh, reduction uh, with the extended iliofemoral approach. So in closing, let's work through a case. This is a 21-year-old involved in a motor vehicle collision. And what I'd like to have you see is the struggle that I can have in reducing hopefully You see a relatively high involvement anteriorly. You see a very small posterior wall. Here is the uh, iliac oblique with a low posterior column involvement and a very subtle posterior wall fracture. This is the 3D reconstruction. 
you see that the anterior involvement is right below the anterior inferior iliac spine. There you see the 3D reconstruction. The posterior wall involvement. So the important questions I think is what's the radiographic diagnosis? Is there any complicating factor? Is there a pelvic ring injury? Is there a subtle SI joint injury? I'll tell you there are not. And then what are the surgical moves, tricks, and tools to reduce the transverse fracture? So let's just walk through the interoperative uh, photos. This is the initial uh, situation. Here you see a typical setup where I'll utilize a chance pin in the ischiopubic segment and an attempt at reduction, which is not successful with a short angle jaw forcep. And then I'm elevating uh, off the quadrilateral surface, showing here uh, a finger on the anterior column, just to show you that you can go all the way to the anterior column and palpate the transverse component of the fracture. Here's a mistake that you can make. That is utilizing a screw to screw clamp after the short angle jaw forcep is not successful, uh, a screw to screw clamp, but please note, this is a mistake. There's a screw across the transverse fracture and you're not going to be able to reduce that. So then we can reorient that uh, transverse, uh, reorient that screw above the transverse fracture and uh, Quite frankly, I was struggling with this uh, fracture reduction. I have a posterior column plate across the low transverse uh, fracture posteriorly. And when I got the appropriate reduction, I can put a screw up in the proximal uh, intact iliac segment, which you see there. And then I utilize an asymmetrical verbruge on this fracture to slowly get the appropriate reduction. I come with an anterior column screw, a true lag screw, a three, five, two, five combination. With the two, five there, a screw placement there. And then an additional lag screw, which is actually more perpendicular to the fracture uh, for this transverse fracture. As you see there, and then we address the posterior wall, just like Eric Johnson uh, told you last week. You see here an under contoured plate with an appropriate reduction on the obturator oblique and the iliac oblique view. Don't always get a CT scan, but in this case, uh, confirm appropriate reduction of the posterior wall in this 21-year-old male. So in conclusion, the majority of transverse and transverse posterior wall uh, fractures can be addressed with a Coker-Langenbeck. We may occasionally utilize the anterior approach, especially with multiple pelvic ring injuries. Learn to maximize ex exposure as we talked about last week. And really the uh, tactics are gonna be the short angle jaw forcep, a screw to screw clamp, and a chance pin in the ischial tuberosity. Thank you very much. Thanks, Phil. That was great. Well, uh, while we switch over here, um, maybe you could address the, the question that has come up, which is uh, that if you're talking about a transverse fracture, it's a simple fracture, um, or an elementary fracture. Uh, why is it that we prefer to approach those with a coker langenbeck uh, If there's no associated pelvic ring injury, why not approach them with some form of an anterior approach? Yeah, I think that's uh, obviously a common question and a really good one. The first thing I would say is that there's no question in my mind that I, if, if I'm the patient, I would rather have an anterior approach. It's friendlier to the muscles as opposed to a coker langenbeck The problem is our reduction strategies are just so much better uh, from the posterior approach as opposed to the anterior approach. 
I, I showed you a case where I did it with the pelvic ring pathology, but I'll tell you the, the clamp placement, uh, the ability to uh, avoid the gapping peripherally is much more difficult uh, from an anterior approach. And it really gets at because the iliopsoas is right oftentimes in the way of our transverse fracture and clamp application. So I think if any, if we have a transverse fracture, an isolated transverse, I think it's a unanimous uh, situation unless you're dealing with mitigating factors, that's soft tissue concerns, or pelvic ring pathology uh, that you're going to want to go from a coker langenbeck not an anterior approach. Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, we're going to move on now to the last of the three fractures in the transverse family. Um, let me just make sure I have everything on here. Uh, and so that's a discussion of the T-shaped fracture. And as we've seen, the T-shaped fracture is a part of the transverse family where the primary fracture line is the transverse fracture. And so the transverse fracture will separate the acetabulum into an intact ilium component or a roof component, if you wish to think about it that way. Uh, and the lower component, which is the ischiopubic segment. Uh, and, and so with the T-shaped fracture, this component can still be transtectal, juxtatectal, or infratectal, as with any of the transverse family. But in this case, we now have a secondary vertical fracture line that divides the ischiopubic segment into an anterior component or an anterior column component and a posterior column component. And so those are typically referred to as the pubic component and the ischial component of the T-shaped fracture. Now, typically, this stem of the T, this vertical component, divides the roof of the obturator foramen and then divides the ischial ramus. Uh, and in uh, the study of T-shaped fractures in Letronel's book, uh, this comprised uh, the most common uh, T-shaped fracture. However, there are anterior and there are posterior variants. And so the anterior variant you can see down here in the bottom left um, has a fracture that can involve sometimes the body of the pubis or just adjacent to or even extending into the symphysis pubis. And the posterior or ischial T-shaped fracture uh, has a fracture line that skirts the obturator foramen and, and exits the posterior border of the bone, usually through the ischial tuberosity. And we can see that on the 3D uh, scan on the bottom right. Um, now, if you look at the schematic drawing um, of the ischial T, you can see that it, it resembles the transverse posterior wall. And in fact, you can read in Letourneau's book where he discusses the controversy about why this is not included as a transverse posterior wall fracture. And his uh, rationale for this was that uh, because this fragment included all of the posterior border of the bone of the greater and lesser sciatic notches, as well as the cotyloid fossa and all of the posterior articular surface, that it was more appropriate to consider this to be a T-shaped fracture. And so this is what we term the ischial T-shaped fracture. So the radiographic features uh, are simply those of the transverse. So again, we would have the iliopectineal and ilioischial lines disrupted, and the roof may be involved or preserved dependent upon the location of the transverse. So the transtectal transverse would involve the roof shadow, whereas the juxtatectal and infratectal uh, uh, T-shaped fractures would preserve the roof shadow. But there will always be a segment of the roof which is intact to the iliac wing, helping us distinguish this from the, uh, any type of associated bulk column fracture. Uh, the transverse component in a T-shaped fracture is always displaced. I think there was only one case of a non-displaced T-shaped fracture uh, in Letourneau's uh, series. Um, and the stem of the T is typically, as a secondary fracture, less displaced or can be less displaced uh, than that of the transverse component. So the radiographic features of the stem of the T, the most clearly seen feature will be that of the ischial ramus fracture. And so we look for that when we think we have a transverse uh, fracture in order to see that there might be uh, a T-shaped component to it. 
you will also very frequently see a separation of the iliopectineal and ilioischial line. If you look at this example on the right, you can see how both are clearly disrupted, but they're also clearly separated in relation to each other. You may also see a disruption of the two limbs of the teardrop, as we can see here, where a portion of the teardrop is with the anterior column component and a portion of the teardrop remains with the posterior column component. The fracture line that exits through the cotyloid fossa into the obturator ring can be difficult sometimes to pick up on plain radiographs, although we will see it usually on the uh, obturator oblique view, but it is very easily seen on the axial CT scan as we can follow the stem of the T down into the obturator foramen and then through the ischial ramus. Now a T-shaped fracture can also be associated with a posterior wall component, uh, and at least uh, in, in Letronel's book, this recognized subgroup, that of the T-shaped fracture with posterior wall, is actually included in the transverse posterior wall family rather than in the pure T-shaped fracture, pa uh, uh, fracture pattern. Now, one of the things that comes up, uh, which can be quite difficult radiographically, uh, is understanding the difference between the T-shaped fracture and a fracture we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, which is the anterior wall posterior hemitransverse. As you can see, both have an anterior component and a posterior aspect of a transverse. The difference being here that the anterior wall plus posterior hemitransverse fracture that we see on the right is not associated with an ischial ramus fracture, and there's a double disruption of the iliopectineal line. So we have a disruption of the iliopectineal line in the upper part uh, of the pelvic brim, um, in the more cranial aspect of the anterior wall, and then also lower where the fracture comes across the root of the superior pubic ramus, as opposed to the T-shaped fracture where we will see an ischial ramus fracture. And we typically will see a higher exit point for the transverse into the greater sciatic notch than we will see with the anterior wall posterior hemitransverse, where the posterior column component is a secondary fracture line. This is just a quick uh, 3D to compare the difference between the T-shaped fracture and the anterior wall posterior hemitransverse. And you can clearly see that the predominant fracture line here is the anterior wall component of the, the posterior column or posterior hemitransverse is a secondary and less displaced fracture line as opposed to the T-shaped fracture where the primary fracture line is the transverse and the secondary fracture line is the stem of the T. With a T-shaped fracture, the femoral head will almost always follow the displacement of the posterior column, whereas with an anterior wall posterior hemitransverse, the femoral head will typically follow the anterior wall component in a more anterior medial uh, displacement direction. So when we talk about T-shaped fractures, this is actually a, probably a, a, a fracture that causes people the most um, to, to spend the most time in considering what's the appropriate choice of approach. Because in theory, you can approach a T-shaped fracture from a posterior approach alone. You can approach a T-shaped fracture from an anterior approach alone. You can uh, approach it from simultaneous anterior and posterior approaches. You could approach it with sequential anterior and posterior approaches with a direct reduction of fixation of each column individually, or you could utilize an extensile approach. And so the question is, if we're gonna try and choose between all of these various options, is it just surgeon's preference or is there something that guides us in determining our surgical approach? And I think the two critical things to remember here is that when you consider a T-shaped fracture, the posterior column displacement is typically uh, more significant than that of the anterior column. The reason for this is one, the femoral head is typically following the posterior column fracture. And if you look down at the line drawing of the T-shaped fracture, you can see that the posterior col column component is a free floating fracture fragment. It's not remaining attached to anything. Whereas the anterior column component of the T-shaped fracture remains attached to the symphysis pubis in most cases. Therefore, you have a hinge point for the anterior column fracture, whereas you do not typically have that for the posterior column component of this. And so 
The advantage of approaching this from the back is that you can do a direct reduction of the posterior column component, which is the more free floating and, and greater displaced fracture. And you can do a more indirect reduction of the anterior column component by hinging it on the intact symphysis pubis. That is, if the symphysis pubis is intact. Now, uh, unlike some of the other fracture patterns that we looked at last week, here, the T-shaped fracture is definitely facilitated by positioning the patient prone. Uh, and I think that goes for all of the transverse family of fractures. It facilitates working through the greater sciatic notch, which is a necessity, and particularly where we're trying to manipulate an anterior column from the back by working through the greater sciatic notch, we really need to maximize our exposure. And so prone positioning will help us safely maximize uh, the exposure of the coker langenbeck we also are going to need to be able to directly reposition the femoral head. And so we will need either distal traction or lateral traction or a combination of both in order to position the femoral head under the roof so that we can proceed with the reduction and fixation of the T-shaped fraction. Usually the typical uh, reduction uh, sequence is that we will attempt a reduction of the anterior column. So we can do that by either displacing the posterior column and working sort of through the stem of the T-shaped fracture to gain the reduction of the anterior column, or we can work around the posterior column fracture through the greater sciatic notch. In either case, we're going to assess the reduction of the anterior column by palpation of the anterior column component on the quadrilateral surface, plus or minus visualization of that portion if that fracture line is very posterior and can be seen when the posterior column is displaced. But we're really going to rely on a fluoroscopic assessment of the reduction at the pelvic brim and the anterior articular surface, as well as a fluoroscopic assessment of the anterior rim. We would then fix the anterior column if we can get it reduced with screw fixation that goes both perpendicular to the anterior column component, as well as perhaps neutralization, screw fixation long down the anterior column. And then we would proceed with reduction and fixation of the posterior column component. As you can see here, these uh, intraoperative fluoro shots here, we have a chance pin helping to manipulate the posterior column in place. We have a uh, angled or helping to, in this case, rotate or displace the posterior column so that an angled jaw clamp can be placed through the greater sciatic notch to reduce the anterior column component. Uh, we are looking fluoroscopically and saying that the pelvic brim and the anterior rim and anterior articular surface appear to be reduced uh, in that situation on the uh, left-hand side. And this is really where some type of a quadrangular angled clamp to work through the greater sciatic notch is pretty much mandatory. And then uh, oftentimes, we'll use a lag screw technique to try and bring the anterior column in place if we, that screw is placed perpendicular to the anterior column component. You can see uh, here a uh, lag screw technique uh, being placed with a, a, a screw being tightened to, uh, to aid in the, re uh, the reduction, rather, of the anterior column component of the T-shaped of the fracture. So here we can see a T-shaped fracture with a significant displacement of the posterior column. There's actually a segmental fracture of the posterior column separating a segment of the greater sciatic notch separately from the remaining portion of the posterior column. And then a, a lesser displaced anterior column component. We can see here on the Jude views, the significant displacement of the posterior column with the femoral head following the posterior column. And then the lesser, to a lesser extent, the displacement of the anterior column. We can also appreciate that this is a transtectal T-shaped fracture. Uh, the CT scan on the axial views help to see the uh, division, the, the separation between the anterior and posterior columns with the femoral head following that posterior column fracture line. And this is approached all through a coker langenbeck with the reduction technique that we uh, spoke about reducing the anterior column and placing lag screws that are perpendicular to the anterior column first. That's why we, we, see we don't have screws that are going long down the anterior column because they're not perpendicular to a transtectal transverse component in the anterior column. And then a uh, plate fixation close to the greater sciatic notch 
because of the segmental nature of the posterior column fracture, uh, two plates were used posteriorly on the retroacetabular surface. And we can see the reduction of that segmental posterior column is not quite perfect up there at the uh, greater sciatic notch. Um, and uh, the reduction of the uh, anterior column, a little bit difficult to assess there on the obturator oblique. This is a radiograph at two years uh, with the patient having a essentially normal radiographic and clinical outcome uh, from his T-shaped fracture. So if we're unable to reduce the anterior column, uh, what we need to do is uh, first, we need to make sure that we didn't screw up and place any fixation that might be blocking the anterior column reduction. As you can see here, uh, I have a lag screw that was placed across the posterior column uh, that was interfering with my anterior column reduction. Uh, but if we're unable to reduce the anterior column, we're going to have to reduce and fix the posterior column. Uh, and, and then as we can see here, with a posterior column is uh, fixed with really provisional fixation. So we haven't uh, fixed the posterior column with uh, our definitive fixation yet, but it's stable enough now that we can reattempt the reduction of the anterior column. And so now we're gonna reattempt the reduction with the angle jaw clamp again placed onto the uh, pelvic brim portion of the anterior column, and then a lag screw that is placed perpendicular to the anterior column uh, that enables us to close that uh, small residual gap uh, and reduce the anterior column. And now we can go ahead and uh, change our posterior column fixation to a more definitive um, uh, fixation construct for the posterior column component. Finally, though, if we're unable to reduce the anterior column of the T-shaped fracture, we're going to have to bail out. We're gonna to have to leave our posterior column fixation intact, make sure that none of our fixation is crossing the stem of the T, and then uh, we would perform a sequential anterior approach to reduce the anterior column component. Here we can see a transtectal T-shaped uh, fracture. Uh, and this one is uh, complicated by the fact that we have a medial fracture of the superior pubic ramus and a segmental fracture of the ischiopubic, seg uh, ischiopubic ramus, as well as an external rotation through the ipsilateral sacroiliac. Where we know that this is going to be a little bit more difficult situation. Uh, and we can uh, see here again, the transtectal nature of the fracture, as well as the segmental fracturing of the anterior column component and the posterior column component at the ischial ramus. And so in this situation, uh, an attempt was made at the anterior column reduction, but because of the comminution and the segmental nature of it, it was not possible to reduce the anterior column. And so the posterior column is uh, reduced and fixed, as you can see here. Uh, and make sure that none of the fixation crosses into the anterior column, and then perform a sequential anterior approach for the reduction of that anterior column uh, fracture line, uh, anterior column component of the T uh, with fixation to cross the uh, superior pubic ramus fracture medially. Uh, and the Jude views that we can see here, uh, showing the concentric reduction of the femoral head in the acetabulum. So, when would we not choose a coker langenbeck primarily for a T-shaped fracture? Well, the main time is going to be when we have associated pelvic ring injuries. And so if we have a symphysis dislocation, now that means that the anterior column component of the T-shaped fracture is now a free fragment, and we would not expect that we would be able to hinge it in from a coker langenbeck approach. Or if we have a sacroiliac dislocation or a displaced sacral fracture, we're going to need to reposition the ilium in space first. And so that may require an open reduction of the posterior pelvic ring in order to bring the ilium in place so that the roof is in the correct location. So we therefore can pr proceed with our reduction of the T-shaped fracture. Other times we wouldn't choose the coker langenbeck initially is when we have anterior column comminution uh, particularly at the pelvic brim, which is going to prevent our assessment or reduction attempts from the coker langenbeck approach, uh, or where there's primary displacement of the anterior column uh, over the posterior column, which is a very unusual situation. So just a quick example here of a uh, T-shaped fracture. This is a juxtatectal T-shaped fracture with an associated sacroiliac joint dislocation, which is irreducible. You can see here on the inlet view, the dislocation uh, of the sacroiliac joint, as well as the displacement of the T-shaped fracture. And there are contralateral ramus fractures that we can see uh, as well. And so this was approached first with a prone open reduction of the sacroiliac joint, 
uh, clamp placed through the greater sciatic notch, iliosacral screws placed for the sacroiliac joint dislocation, followed by then a prone coker langenbeck approach for the reduction of the T-shaped fracture all through the coker langenbeck approach. Now, this could potentially have been approached from an anterior approach, uh, but the uh, irreducible nature of the sacroiliac joint dislocation uh, made me favor a posterior approach for the SI joint. You can see here the uh, four-year follow-up after removal of the iliosacral screws. Here's a, a T-shaped fracture with a, an associated posterior wall and also an ipsilateral sacroiliac joint dislocation. And so now we have a situation that sets up very nicely for a staged anterior approach that allows us to reduce the sacroiliac joint dislocation, fix that, and reduce and fix the anterior column, fix it, uh, anterior column component uh, with a provisional fixation, and then perform a coker langenbeck as a secondary uh, surgical approach for the reduction of the posterior column and posterior wall component. And here we can see the patient at uh, a three-year follow-up with some heterotopic ossification in the abductors, which did not cause a clinical um, uh, result or significant uh, deficit. One last time when we wouldn't choose a coker langenbeck initially here is a T-shaped fracture, transtectal T-shaped fracture with comminution at the pelvic brim. And so we see this fragment here from the pelvic brim. This is going to remove our ability to palpate a reduction of the anterior column and also maybe uh, prevent us from placing a clamp at the pelvic brim in an appropriate location for the reduction of the T-shaped of the fracture. Uh, in addition, we have a posterior wall component, so we know we are going to need to have a posterior approach at one point. And so here again, we approach this sequentially with an anterior approach to reduce the anterior column component uh, because of that uh, comminution along the pelvic brim, followed by a posterior approach for the posterior column component. And you can see that when sequential approaches for T-shaped fractures are performed, it's very common to end up with a displacement through the stem of the T. And that's why we see that gapping at the ischial ramus and that gapping at the roof of the obturator foramen, although there is a small bending wedge of uh, comminution there. But that's a very typical outcome that uh, we will perform the reduction cranially on the T-shaped fracture, but caudally we will see that gapping implying to us that the uh, reduction of the columns to each other is not exactly correct. So in summary, most T-shaped fractures are amenable to operation through a prone coker langenbeck approach. Uh, the reduction of all transverse family fractures, I think, is facilitated by prone positioning. But remember that a secondary surgical approach may be necessary for T-shaped fractures if there's an associated pelvic ring injury or an inability to reduce the anterior column. We have about, uh, well, we had some time uh, set aside to sort of summarize all of the fractures that we've talked about here and um, yesterday, uh, last week rather, and, and this week. And so, as you can see, these fracture patterns, these six fracture patterns are generally considered to be sort of a, a posterior group of fracture patterns because they are most commonly operated from posterior approaches. Not always, but most commonly. And so if we remember from last week, we saw uh, discussions of the posterior wall fracture and the posterior column plus, uh, as well as posterior column plus posterior wall fractures. Uh, and so Dr. Krieger told us last week that uh, the posterior wall fracture could be approached through a coker langenbeck approach or through a Gibson approach. Um, and this applied to the posterior column or posterior column posterior wall fractures as well, although most of those are typically approached through a coker langenbeck. Um, for all three of these fractures, Prone positioning may be advantageous, but lateral positioning is certainly an option. Uh, and um, the surgeries, the Coker Langenbeck or the Gibson, can be performed with or without a fracture table. Exceptional posterior walls, particularly those that are high uh, cranial or anterior, uh, might benefit from a digastric osteotomy performed as a component of either a coker langenbeck or a Gibson approach in order to facilitate increasing the anterior exposure uh, that is necessary for some of these very high cranial posterior wall variants. And then today, as we've heard, the transverse family of fractures are most commonly operated through a coker langenbeck but if associated with displaced pelvic ring injuries, it may alter our primary surgical approach. 
and certain T-shaped fractures may require two approaches or an extended approach right off of the bat. What I wanted to do now is just take a minute or two to have you take a look at this uh, x-ray. All right, here's the AP pelvis x-ray. Here's the obturator oblique view. And here's the iliac oblique view. And I'm gonna go back to the AP pelvis. And I'm gonna ask you now, uh, Angel, this would be the time to go ahead and put up the question. Uh, we're gonna ask you, now you can drag on your computer, you can move the, the poll window off of the x-ray, just grab it uh, by the gray uh, part at the top and move it off of the uh, x-ray so that you can see uh, the x-ray. And I'd like to ask you to classify this fracture. And obviously it's gonna be one of the six fracture patterns that we talked about either last week or this week. So go ahead and select, please, the posterior wall, posterior column, posterior column, posterior wall, transverse, transverse plus posterior wall or T-shaped fracture. There's our obturator oblique view again. So that's fantastic. 87% of you selected transverse posterior wall. Some people selected posterior column, posterior wall, and some T-shaped fracture. You close that, Angel. So uh, if we look at the uh, obturator oblique, we see that we do not uh, see a fracture of the ischial ramus. And so that would rule out for us uh, the T-shaped fracture. And we see a disruption of the iliopectineal line, uh, which is the anterior uh, column extension of the transverse fracture. And so this would not be a posterior column plus posterior wall fracture. And so the majority, vast majority of you were correct in selecting transverse posterior wall. We can show you now some cuts of the axial CT, uh, which confirm uh, our um, diagnosis. And uh, we have cuts then through the roof of the obturator frame and in the ischial ramus to confirm that there's no fracture there. And so we have confirmed our diagnosis, uh, which is a, that of a transverse posterior wall. Now, I would just ask you one other thing, if you uh, could bring up the other poll question to subclassify the transverse uh, component. And this uh, should only take a couple of seconds to make a call, transtectal, juxtatectal, or infratectal on the location of the transverse. Transtectal, two thirds of you selected, juxtatectal about a third, and one person or five people went for uh, infratectal. Well, if you look through here, right, the easiest way is probably to look on the issue pubic segment, and we can see that there's a small component of roof here adjacent to the cotyloid fossa, and so we know that the correct answer for this one would be a transtectal, and so we have selected transtectal transverse posterior wall, and actually it's a multifragmentary posterior wall. The 3D helps us confirm that what we're seeing here is the transverse with a multifragmentary posterior wall. And so this is operated through a coker langenbeck approach prone, single surgical approach uh, with reduction and fixation. And we can see here the immediate post-operative Jude views of the reduction of the transverse and the posterior wall component. Small gap uh, in the anterior portion of the transverse fracture that we can see there in the roof, which is not desirable, but it's the way it ended up. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop my uh, screen and we're going to now switch gears and move to fracture patterns that are uh, typically um, considered uh, to be more anterior based fracture patterns. And to start us off, Keith Mayo is going to uh, discuss for us uh, the ilioinguinal approach as used for anterior fracture patterns. <laughs> 
All right, good morning. Um, it'll be difficult to top those last two discussions of probably the most, uh, most nuanced and difficult topics in pelvis and aft tabular surgery. Okay, so what we're going to talk is now talk about the anterior approaches. And the objectives are relatively straightforward, a very brief history, indications in terms of fracture types, which have already been uh, alluded to, and then a step-by-step -step surgical technique with a discussion of oral logistics with really no discussion of reduction techniques this week. Uh, that will be next week. So the history, um, most people start with Smith-Peterson in 1917, although this was really not an anterior approach, it was a lateral approach, which Levine in 1943 essentially took the same rough skin incision and did an inter internal anomaly exposure. And this is the first approach described for use in acetabular fractures. And I think he's been left out of the history. And then Lotonel described the ileo um, after a year in the cadaver lab in 1960. This is followed by the so-called modified, highly modified stop or, or anterior to pelvic by Dean Cole and Brett Paul Hoffner in 94. Pararectus in 2012. And then uh, many other people have tried different ways of getting into the pelvis from the front. One of the biggest experiences, which we really don't know much about, is Edgardo Ramos from Mexico, who is, uh, has also pioneered another a potential surgical approach. Emile was sent to the lab by Robert Jude in 1959 because they really did not have adequate access to the entire anterior aspect of the anomaly bone. And so his year in the anatomy lab produced the results with surgical access roughly corresponding on your left to the entire internal aspect of the anomaly bone down to including the ischial spine, the entire superior ramus, and then the contralateral uh, anterior ring as well, if it was extended. As I generally, a, we would like to uh, limit our exposure on the external aspect of the anomaly bone because of blood supply considerations to potential intercalary segments. The indications we've already seen, basically these are the approaches for all of the anterior lesions, wall and column, uh, as well as the associated anterior posterior hemitransverse in most both columns, some transverse, some T, and then very rarely a very high posterior column fracture exiting high in the greater static notch. I'm not going to belabor those um, points, which have already been covered very well. Complicating factors, well, surgical delay is, is an issue because if we're beyond a couple of weeks and we have a difficult time fully debriding callus, then there are both the original injury and iatrogenic problems with the soft tissues from the viewpoint of suprapubic drainage or colostomies, external fixator pin tracks, crush injuries, and then the obesity epidemic, and then what our general surgery colleagues have left us uh, from their previous herniography, since most herniographies are now reinforced with mesh. Just want to talk briefly about a couple anatomic issues. <clears throat> These are adjacent diagrams of the venous uh, circulation of the pelvis one from a medial aspect and one from an anterior. And it, I think the critical part of this is where the external iliac vein, soon to become femoral vein, is in close proximity to the anterior column. Another way to look at that is looking forward so that if we look at the, um, this is the linea aspera in the middle. Let's go back, sorry. When he asked for in the middle, at this point, just prop posterior to the obturator frame, and this is the obturator neurovascular bundle, this is where the, the iliac vein is the closest to the pelvic brim. And if we look at the complication that I've seen uh, from anterior approaches, the venous complications far outweigh those of the arterial complications. 
So this is a elderly patient with an associated anterior posterior hemitransverse looking at the anterior um, view and then an iliac oblique or an obturator oblique view. And we can imagine the deviation of the internal or the external iliac vessels over this displaced anterior column. And so that if we are dealing with this column displaced before we dissect around it, especially if we're sweeping underneath this with a, a cog elevator, then the potential for injury is very significant. That's accentuated in this arteriogram of a pelvic malunion, but you can imagine that the vein is adjacent to it um, and actually a little bit more posterior. The next issue is the lymphatics uh, to the lower extremity. A major lymphatic trunk uh, runs in the areolar tissue just medial to the vessels. And it is certainly possible if you skeletonize the vessels and are aggressive to interrupt that major lymphatic trunk. It's unclear to me how the vascular surgeons get away with this relatively routinely, but I've had at least one case where postoperative swelling, I think, was at least in part due to my aggressive early mobilization of the vessels. So our surgical approach is this in terms of skin incisions. We have the, and generally we would always like to have the entire abdomen prep free into the surgical field with or without the ipsilateral limb. We'll see that more in a bit. The incision is above the symphysis by about two to three centimeters and it's been very carefully sealed from the perineum. The lateral limb is below the iliac crest because most people do not like having incisions over bone on the lateral ilium. And then we're going to take this incision across the midline. So I'm, I'm going to try to conceptually organize this so that we understand what we're doing as far as our access to the two pelvis. So this is the um, primal pot belly uh, depiction of the parietal, the parietal uh, peritoneum. And that's what we're trying to avoid, although we, if we do inadvertently get into the abdominal, abdominal cavity, we certainly have ways of managing that. And then our first layer on top of that is the transversus abdominis. And within that, in the distal portion, is the sheath that, in which the two heads of the rectus uh, run uh, to ultimately insert on the pubic bodies. Then we're going to add the internal oblique and then the external oblique. And so we have three layers of abdominal muscles running in different directions. And they are then attached to the iliac crest on the lateral aspect, the inguinal ligament distally and the pubic body, and then posteriorly either to the vertebral column or lumbodorsal fascia. So what we're looking at then is essentially two options as far as our exposure. One of those is it, this full length incision in which we're going to essentially at, remove the insertions of the abdominal muscles and then retract them proximally and medially. Or my version, which we'll see today in more detail, is a lateral exposure which takes to the a point medial, just medial to the vessels that leaves the vessels undissected and a secondary midline incision which are very closely mimic what Claude is going to show you in a bit. And then we're going to have a traction proximally in a similar way, and then medially for the midline split. That leaves us with, in terms of schematics, three windows, a lateral window, which is lateral um, to the iliopsoas musculature, and takes us back to the sacroiliac joint, gives us the entire internal iliac fossa, and then a medial window between the iliac vessels and the femoral compartment. And then in the traditional description in which um, the uh, ipsilateral rectus abdominis has been released, as well as the medial portion of the conjoint tendon, then we have our third window, which is directly in front of the bladder. Um, and it, it basically is a full takedown of the conjoint tendon of the internal oblique plus transversus abdominis. Modifications, most of the illustrations you'll see today were from this JOT article last year. Stop of variance, we'll see more in a bit. The tensor sheath extension I have not found to be particularly useful. And there'll be times when planned or, or, or potential 
se uh, sequential approaches will modify how extensive you will dissect or develop each of these windows. So what we see in the initial portion of the exposure is the external oblique with fibers running along this path. And so the release should take essentially the entire aponeurotic periosteal, fascial periosteal cuff with it down to the border with the abductor fascia. It extends posterior to gluteus medius pillar, and then I usually split longitudinally in line with the external oblique fibers since the posterior portion of this muscle cuff has a very tenuous fascial insertion. So what it looks like after that development, we will see that in the posterior portion, we have a split between the fibers of the external oblique, roughly in line, and then we have this single cuff of tissue, which includes the external internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. And although we don't really see them individually as layers, and the extension goes posterior to the gluteus medius pillar. Attempts to truncate this exposure, I think, are um, not well thought out because they, in, they trade a small incision for additional deep muscle damage. The exposure that we get with that, then when it's fully developed, and this is after all three windows have been developed, but this is the internal iliac fossa exposure. And the posterior extent here shows the final fibers of the iliacus back in the back, as well as the sacroiliac joint here, the pelvic brim here, the L5 nerve root. This is the sacral ala. And it's surprising how close the internal iliac vein is uh, to the L5 nerve root in most dissections. So this gives us a panoramic exposure of the internal iliac fossa. We then have to develop the second window. And this has a larger subcutaneous dissection than we would normally have, in which we can see the anterior spine, the midline, the right rectus. And in this case, we've dissected out the spermatic cord, although usually I would not do that. And then we have the external oblique aponeurosis. So what we're going to do is in incise the external oblique aponeurosis from the anterior spine, usually to the lateral border of the rectus sheath, and reflect the inferior portion of the aponeurosis distally, which then exposes the inguinal ligament, which embryologically is essentially a continuation of the external oblique. And we're going to take a couple millimeters of inguinal ligament with this conjoint tendon of the internal oblique and transversus abdominis. The original exposure would take this all the way over to the pubic tubercle and would then go over the vessels to the transversalis fascia and then take down the medial portion. Today, we will stop our dissection at the iliac vessels. So now we're going to do this release of the conjoint tendon. And again, taking two or three millimeters, depending on the size of the ligament. That brings us into the discussion of the iliopectinal fascia. So we have this a natural demarcation between the neural compartment um, on the here, which is the iliopsoas and femoral nerve and the vascular compartment here with the lymphatics in this position. And this fascia is frequently accompanied by a psoas minor tendon as depicted here. So about 40% of people have a psoas minor tendon which actually has a separate insertion onto the pelvic brim and actually gives us, in many cases, a much more complex insertion to deal with, whether we're dealing it from, with it from the other side of the table or from this. So what we're gonna do is after our deep dissection, then our, this is our sectioned conjoint tendon. We've mobilized the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of the thigh, and then we're looking down on the dorsal medial aspect of the iliopsoas, and here's the femoral nerve. So we are now going to dissect between this structure and the vessels which are immediately adjacent. And so now we have this retractor, which is in the false pelvis, retracting the iliopsoas uh, and femoral nerve laterally, and this blunt homan in the true pelvis, 
with the iliopectineal fascia under direct visualization. So we're going to incise that down to the pubic root. And then we're going to follow it under direct visualization posteriorly along the pelvic brim. This is a different view of the same structure, which Claude will show you in a bit, but the takedown is in the same anatomic plane. Once that's been released, then we have this view. So once again, iliopsoas, femoral nerve here. This is the vascular compartment where we stopped our dissection at the lateral border of the, of the vessels. This is a obturator anastomosis, which frequently we don't see because we have a retractor down here and it's essentially pulling that with us. We don't know where that obturator anastomosis is going. Most of the studies have shown about two thirds of the time there is some communication, but a true corona mortis, uh, which is an a anomalous origin of the obturator artery from the inferior epigastric is relatively uncommon, certainly less than 10% in most studies. So we now have this exposure and we're not gonna dissect any further medial on this side. Um, we know that we have vascular access if we need to, so we can extend this proximally and distally. If we need to, for some reason, if there's a vascular injury we have to deal with, we can do it. So our exposure then is, it can be taken all the way back to the sacroiliac joint, through, although rarely we do that through the second window. We can usually get to mid ramus through the second window. The third window is then very similar to what Claude's going to go through, but it's slightly different sequence. I usually operate it from this side of the table, so we're going to split in the midline. So once again, here's our intervascular interval in the second or middle window where we've been working. So we're going to split usually about 10 centimeters. We'll see the both heads of the rectus. And then I usually switch to the opposite side of the table at this point because I'm right-handed. And then we'll elevate this uh, fascial periosteal sleeve in which the insertion of the ipsilateral rectus is a continuity. And as we then move more medial, we'll see the superior ramus. And now because we're retracting the iliac vessels laterally, that anastomosis, which we saw from the second window and appeared to be quite lax, this appears to essentially be plastered up against the superior ramus. So we'll almost always see something in this area. Again, a true obturator artery takeoff is more unusual. And our final exposure then is this, which is the uh, internal iliac fossa, the quadrilateral surface, and we can extend this down the posterior column to the, uh, in, to the ischial spine with other retractors as necessary. So what do we need to get the most out of this approach? Well, we need, in my view, stable distal lateral traction. We need complete imaging capability, including AP and Jude obliques, as well as a posterior pelvis. And then my view is that you should be able to assess every reduction from at least two vantage points. I've been fooled many times thinking I have a palpably reduced and visually reduced from one uh, exposure and then found through either the second or the third window that I was off. It's a, it's a second check. Logistics are these. We have to deal with the table, the prep, and the traction variance. We have two options, the fracture table, specialty fracture table or radio loosening table. The fracture table does give us an easier prep and drape as well as dedicated distal lateral traction which will give us a stable femoral head position, which I think is critical for most of these fracture patterns. This is what the last iteration of the Jude table uh, with the uh, abdomen and uh, proximal hindquarter prepped in the surgical field with the dedicated distal lateral traction attached. That's an expensive alternative. Most of you do, do not have this table, so you need an alternative. Uh, you can use this uh, traction attachment developed by Steve Sims and Mike Stover, which is essentially an adaptation of the universal distractor. I'll show you this again in a minute, but it'll attach to any fracture table. The radial lucid table has additional advantages. It, it, the leg and hip mobility are useful uh, in some cases, and you certainly have 
less impeded imaging of the posterior ring. So we want in that situation to have and usually the entire abdomen and the ipsilateral hindquarter prepped into the single surgical field. And our option then for distal lateral traction is this. So this is the hip flex to about 45 degrees. That is the position we obtain first. And we will very early then place a shan screw in the proximal femur and then place this traction attachment to the side of the table, uh, approximating the, the perfect distal lateral distraction vector. And so if we have the shan screw in the proximal femur, in later cases, we don't have a perineal post, so we need a counter traction, and that may require fixing the contralateral pelvis to the table as well. This is particularly true in older cases. So how you manage the patient setup and your logistics may influence your reduction and fixation techniques. So if you're on a fracture table, the fracture table usually only allows about 20 to 25 degrees of hip flexion. And in a muscular male, uh, that really limits your ability to optimize the first window because of the size of the iliocellus and in some cases the size of the abdominal wall. And so for that situation, you're gonna be using the second window more often. The opposite of that, to some extent is true with the radiolucent table, which allows you to freely flex up to 60 degrees. And then your first and third windows become a bit more uh, useful um, by, by virtue of the fact that they're expanded and the hip flexion, once you're working in it, will have a tendency to somewhat collapse the second window. So I, I have had at different points in my career, a fracture table and no fracture table. So I've gone back and forth. And I think there are certainly plus, pluses and minuses to both options. So with that, I'm going to conclude um, with a summary, and that is our the original and modified ilioinguinal uh, approaches remain important approaches, and they have essentially identical surgical indications. All anterior lesions associated uh, both columns, most of those, as well as anterior post posterior hemitransverse. And then the exceptional cases, which you've seen from Phil and Mark earlier today in the transverse family. Um, I think it is important to use all three windows and, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So that if you don't know how to get there, you won't go there. And I'm not saying that I will routinely use all three windows for every surgical approach, but having the ability to, to work with some facility around the vessels, no matter which surgical approach you take, I think is key. And then the OR logistics, we've already talked about how that can impact uh, your relative use of the various windows. And the last point I would just want to emphasize that the, we are probably still in an evolutionary phase as far as anterior approaches. And I don't think there's ever a time in history where you're going to know too much anatomy or too many surgical approaches. So the more that you can glean from each additional surgical approach that will help you, the better off you and your patients are going to be long term. So with that, I will stop. Thank you, Keith. Uh, next speaker will be uh, Claude Taji, and he's going to talk to us about the anterior intrapelvic approach while he's bringing up his slides. Uh, Keith, there was a question regarding um, how often do you utilize all three windows, uh, you would say, in, in your practice versus picking and choosing um, some of the windows to utilize? Uh, well, I always use at least the first and second windows. So, and, and so if I had an anterior column, it didn't require me to be any more medial than that, then I would not do more than that. Um, the third window is developed for, um, for most approaches. Um, and I, I, I just like having all three accesses. So I, I can count on one hand the number of times I've used only two of the three windows. All right, we're going to turn it over to uh, Claude Saji for the, the uh, final lecture for today. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Keith.
Uh, all right, so we'll talk about the anterior intrapelvic approach. Those are my disclosures. And I guess the first thing I would say is uh, let's, let's stop calling it the STAPA because if you are a student of history, as clearly Keith Mayo is, uh, in, as he pointed out, you know, that the STAPA really is just a repair of hernia with a Dacron mesh from inside the pelvis. And, and so we're, we're doing is not the STAPA. And what we do now, what, what all these different iterations are that uh, Keith Mayo just alluded to, you know, Herman Salo was, I think, the first one actually who was starting to use something like this. And he referred to it as the ilio anterior approach. And then subsequently, Colin Ballhofter talked about it for acetabular fractures. And Pierre Guy's actually written a nice paper in a supplement in JOT a few years ago about sort of the evolution of this. And, and what Herman Salo and Colin Ballhofter were doing was largely working around the the, the lower half of the iliac fossa and around the infrapectineal area, but not so much the posterior column and quadrilateral surface. And then uh, Keith had a nice uh, paper in JOT in a supplement a couple of years ago that showed, you know, this development of the middle and the medial window, uh, which is sort of along the lines of it. And now what we're doing is, is even a little bit different still. And, and you know, before I, I go into the nuances of the AIP, which is how I like to refer to it. Um, the indications for between this and the alienguinal are pretty are the same, and uh, and, and there's really once you get everything fully developed, uh, there's really not a lot of difference between the two. I don't think, particularly if you're using a lateral window, etc. And we'll get into that in a little bit, but. Uh, and, and, I, and I really appreciate the point that Keith made at the conclusion of his talk. And, and that is, is that, you know, uh, you don't want to be beholden, I think, to one of these approaches. For instance, if you really like the AIP for whatever reason, and you get into it, and then you just can't get what you need to get through the AIP, and you may need to convert to an ileoinquinal or some other variation. So it's good to know the anatomy. It's good to know multiple approaches. And I, I am a firm believer that if you are uh, going to be, let's say, an AIP disciple, you better learn, you even better learn the ilioinguinal and understand the ilioinguinal because it gives you a different appreciation for the anatomy. And like he said, if you don't know how to get there, you won't go there. And sometimes you do need to go there. So I, I really appreciate that comment. Um, the one thing about the AIP is that you're not going to use longitudinal traction on the leg. You're going to flex the leg and use this distal lateral traction from here. And, and the big reason is, is that you really need flexion of the hip to relax the iliopsoas and the external iliac vessels because you're going to be working underneath them. And if you have longitudinal traction here, it tightens the iliopsoas and it makes it harder to get underneath it and make it harder for your exposure. And that obviously is, you know, that, that increases your risk of complications. So, you know, generally in general setup terms, this is what the patient will look like. And one of the things that you still hear people talk about is, well, do you roll the patient onto the affected side? So if you're operating on the left pelvis, should you roll the patient to the left? And the reason people say that is because they inadequately expose this AIP window here. And so they feel they need to peek underneath the rectus muscle to be able to see the acetabulum. And therefore they need to roll the patient onto the left so that they can look down easier. That's wrong. And the reason that's wrong is because if you roll the patient onto the left, it rolls onto their trochanter, that pushes the femoral head into the pelvis and makes it harder to reduce the fracture because the femoral head is now in the way. So there's no rolling of the patient. The patient is flat, all right? And, and that's, I think that's the first key thing that I want to say. And, and before you really start anything, before you start a lot of the exposure, I think the distal lateral traction is uh, really important, just like Keith showed, because when you're working here, you want to get the femoral head out of the way. And you want to get the femoral head out of the way for two different reasons, okay? So if you look at this uh, picture here, you can see how the femoral head is intrapelvic, all right? 
And then that displaces the anterior column, that displaces the quadrilateral surface, and in some cases, the posterior column as well, too. So first of all, if you can get the femoral head out of the way via ligamentotaxis, it does pull the columns and the quadrilateral surface back out of the pelvis a little bit. That's advantageous because that makes the, the section safer. Keith showed a really nice picture of that uh, CT scan and the CT angiogram where it was a malunion, but you can picture that if, the, if an acute fracture, it's doing the same thing where the iliac vessel was displaced so much. Sometimes if this anterior column is displaced enough and it's riding high or cranial, the iliac vessels can roll over. So if you're doing this dissection, you're coming along the anterior column with superior pubic ramus, you may encounter the external iliac vein. So pulling the femoral head out of the pelvis, getting the anterior column down and able, you know, getting this ability to push it out of the way makes the surgical dissection safer. Similarly for the obturator nerve, right? The obturator nerve is on the quadrilateral surface. So if you can get the posterior column, the quadrilateral surface out of the pelvis a little bit, get some tension off the obturator nerve, it makes the, that part of the dissection easier as well too. So uh, I put this picture up here to emphasize where you are. So when we do this approach, you're coming in the axilla between the external and internal iliac vessels, all right? This, this apex right here is the posterior limit of your exposure with this, with this approach. So what does that mean? That means that you need to be cognizant of the fact that rarely this takeoff here or another anomalous takeoffs, such as a corona mortis or et cetera, large ones will occur in this area here. It, you know, granted, it's extremely rare, but it's not zero. So if you have, and you know, you encounter one of these large distal takeoffs or bifurcations, then you need to be aware of that before you just go blazing through along the, 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 the brim. Because if you feel like you're safe, you've gone past the vessel here, you've clipped it or ligated it, and you're just kind of now you think, okay, I'm underneath the iliacus and I'm, and I'm home free. I can just keep blazing all the way back to the SI joint. Well, you might get into trouble. And, and, and this is a good reason why you need to know alternative exposures as well. Because if you're coming along here and you do have a distal takeoff of this uh, or a distal bifurcation, well, then you need to change, you know, you change your approach and say, well, I can only get so far back. I'm not going to get what I need to see. So I'm going to have to convert to an iliguinguinal or something else so that I can uh, improve the rest of my exposure. So just really keep that in mind as you're developing this approach. The key to this is going to be mobilization of the rectus. So that, what does that mean? That means flipping this rectus up and turning it out of the way so you can look straight down at the acetabulum, all right? So you don't have to do this little peeking under. So you're not gonna do a cute little incision, try to be nice and cosmetic, and then just lift this up a little bit and try to peek under. You need to get the rectus out of the way so that you can visualize what you need to see. That means splitting it high. You talked about going into perineal cavity. It's not a big deal if you do. You take a little bit of chromic and you sew up the peritoneum and carry on, all right? And the next thing is, is going to be a nice distal release of the, the rectus off of the pubic bodies distally. Keep in mind, and this is nice for the repair and the conclusion of the case, that below the arcuate line, the anterior rectus fascia is really the only rectus fascia. You only have one very thin layer of transversalis posteriorly that you don't repair. So when you repair, you only repair the anterior rectus fascia because that's where both layers of external oblique, both layers of internal oblique, and one layer of transversalis are all anterior to the rectus at this level, all right? When, when we're doing this exposure, we're lifting and getting the rectus out of the way. So you need to clear these adhesions of the bladder and the pelvic contents from the under, under surface of the rectus because as you retract the rectus to the side of the injury, you don't want it to pull the pelvic contents with you. So pelvic contents want to come towards you, rectus goes towards the injury, all right? 
and split it up nice and high. And don't be afraid of going into the perineal cavity. It's really not the end of the world when you get there. All right. I talked about this releasing the rectus off of the anterior part of the pubic body. A lot of times people will just release it off the superior part of the pubic body here, and that limits how much you can retract and roll the rectus out of the way. The rectus has a very broad aponeurotic insertion all the way down the anterior aspect of the pubic body. So release it. You're not going to completely detach it, but release it. Take it off the anterior aspect of the pubic body so that you can really roll everything out of the way. So now this is uh, this is a little bit different here. This is looking at another heads up here and the foot's down here at the bottom of the screen. But the top of the pubic body is here and you can see how far down we release it. And now that really allows you to move the rectus out of the way and start to retract it laterally and pushing the bladder and the other pelvic contents towards you, the surgeon, and you're standing on the other side over here. So as you release it, you're gonna come lateral and you're gonna release the rectus lateral to the pubic tubercle. Yes, you are releasing the distal insertion of the inguinal ligament. But what that allows you to do is really to look down on top of the superior pubic ramus. So here's pubic body, this is symphysis. And now we're just gonna slowly start coming all the way along the, uh, the superior pubic ramus towards the, uh, the eminence and the psoas gutter. And we're gonna come back to that because that's really important. So what's, what's happening here? This is no different than an iliowinguinal. It's just in the opposite direction. In an iliowinguinal, you're starting in the false pelvis. You come through, you release the iliopectineal fascia, and that gets you into the true pelvis. Here, we're going from true pelvis into false pelvis. Here's an, you know, uh, the view of that anastomosis between the external and the internal uh, vessels, vascular system. And it, it, you know, the, the one thing that's nice about this approach, and, and I'm not, you know, this is what a lot of people do with their ilioinguinals now as they develop this, it does give you a really nice view of this anastomosis. Everyone's got it. Sometimes it's already torn, sometimes it's tiny and you can coagulate it. Sometimes you got to clip it. But it, you know, this does give you a nice view of that entire vessel. And sometimes there are fractures right here in the superior pubic ramus or the distal aspect of the anterior column. And this vessel may be torn. And once you start your dissection, you get some bleeding from the obturator foramen. Well, it's a lot, I think it's a lot easier to get at that through this sort of a trajectory and this sort of approach if you have to control bleeding in the obturator foramen because it's easier to see the obturator nerve, which is down here, and get it out of the way and safely address the bleeding from the obturator foramen without inadvertently putting a clip on the obturator nerve. All right. You got to remember that you have whatever whatever anastomosis you have there, you have to get it out of the way in order to carry on because you want to retract iliacus and the external iliac vein here, the are the two of them, you need to retract them this way. If that anastomosis is intact, the external iliac vein is tethered to the obturator by that anastomosis, and you'll tear it the more you keep retracting. So further posterior exposure is not possible unless you take care of that anastomosis one way or another. And then that behind that is now the iliopectineal fascia. So a little bit of a difference in the way you handle the iliopectineal fascia from AIP to ilioinguinal is that here, all we're doing is releasing the, in, the insertion of the iliopectineal fascia, which is just a continuation of the investing fascia of the iliacus more, more posteriorly. We're just releasing it off the superior pubic ramus. We're not, we're not uh, disrupting the anatomy between the lymphatics and the vessels and the nerve and the iliacus and the iliopsoas muscles. That's all staying intact the way God made it. And then all we're doing is going posteriorly along the ramus and just lifting the iliopectineal fascia off the superior ramus like this so that we can get underneath the iliopectineal fascia. And as we go posteriorly, carry that forward and we get underneath the iliacus muscle. And then that's what gives us this continuity between the true pelvis. Here's true pelvis. This is the brim. Pubic body is here for orientation superior pubic ramus, and this is the lower part of the internal iliac fossa, and there's the obturator nerve. So again, it's just one way of doing it. It's just the opposite direction of the ilioingal approach, but it's, you're trying to accomplish 
the same, the same exact thing. As you go back the, towards the, the sacroiliac joint along the pelvic brim, you have this investing fascia of the iliacus that you have to release here. There's iliacus muscle, internal iliac fossa, and this is just some of that investing fascia, all right? You can see that along here that you can, and just imagine if you had a fracture and then wide displaced placement of the anterior column and that external iliac vein has rolled over. That's why you just have to be really careful as you're coming along here that you recognize that. And if you do have displacement of the anterior column with a roll over the external iliac vein, see it and retract the vein up over the leading edge of that fracture of the anterior column distally. But this will get you all the way down to the anterior aspect of the sacroiliac joint, which is right here. So this is pubic body, superior pubic ramus, brim, and then SI joint. So you can see from the SI joint all the way to the pubic body, okay, when you do this. And you can put screws in all of those places right there. It allows you to get at it. Just remember, you don't want to dissect aggressively medial to the sacroiliac joint because you do have superior gluteal vessels and you've got perhaps the branching and branches coming off the external iliac right in this area right here. So if you know, really be careful that you don't go too medially and just start uh, you know, carelessly going on to the ala of the sacrum because that's where L5 nerve root is and that's where you get branches and superior gluteal vessels. And it's too far posterior. If they start bleeding, you just have to pack it and go to angio you know, or something like that because if you try to get them, you're gonna put clips on things you don't wanna put clips on. It's just gonna well up, patient's gonna lose a lot of blood and you're gonna have more complications. Pack it like you do, you know, pre heel packing for a, a bad pelvic fracture, close it up and go to angiogram, all right? Now, this is important here and this helps the exposure tremendously and that is getting into the psoas gutter, all right? So the psoas gutter is just lateral to the eminence and if you can get into the psoas gutter by releasing the psoas and the iliacus off of the eminence, and these are all Sharpie's fibers, it has to be done sharply, but that helps a lot with your exposure and getting the iliopsoas and everything out of the way. And this is why you need to have that hip flexed and not longitudinal traction because relaxing the iliacus and the external iliac vessels allows you to do this so that you can see all the way over into the psoas gutter, all right? So pubic body, sacroiliac joint, lower one third of the internal iliac fossa. And this is what it would look like interoperatively, not as nice obviously as a cadaver, unfortunately, but it lets you see this. The one other point I wanna make about the, the dissection technical point that is really valuable is to locate the obturator nerve and free it up and dissect it as far as you can proximally and as far as you can distally towards the obturator foramen so that you can mobilize it. You can see here, there's the, the uh, obturator artery, but here's the, the nerve. Because you're gonna wanna work on both sides. You're gonna wanna work medial and lateral to the obturator nerve. If by chance the obturator neurovascular is intact, or sorry, the, the vasculature is intact, so the vein and the artery, my suggestion to you is to go ahead and ligate them. Usually they're torn with the intrapelvic you know, intrusion of the femoral head and the disruption of the quadrilateral surface in the posterior column. But if they're not, go ahead and ligate them because they're not as mobile as the nerve. And if you leave this intact and you keep retracting on it and pushing it around, what can happen sometimes is that you'll tear it and then you'll get all this bleeding at the base of the wound that's really hard to, to control. It's not like it's horrible bleeding, but it's more than one and it'll bother you and it'll really disrupt your visualization. So if it's intact, ligate those vessels. And then once you take the obturator and turn this off, it allows you to retract all the intrapelvic contents so you see the whole medial surface of the quadrilateral surface and posterior column and the greater sciatic notch down to the ischial uh, spine. And that's pretty much the exposure of that. It'll allow you to put various clamps on there to reduce the fracture. So this is what you're gonna see, hopefully, when you've done a nice exposure. And schematically, where you wanna to try to get your uh, retractors is lateral to the pubic tubercle, into the psoas gutter, 
into the internal iliac fossa, just lateral to the sacroiliac joint, anterior to the sacroiliac joint, and anywhere down on postercolumn quadrilateral surface, ischial spine, and even into the lesser sciatic notch. And then that'll help you to move all of these contents out of the way so that you can visualize that whole, that whole uh, picture. Now, that's through the AIP window. On occasion, you're gonna have to develop the lateral window because you can't access the crest. Um, I, I like to do the osteotomy because this, if you just kind of do, uh, you know, like Keith was talking, a truncated version of the lateral window, it just ends up more muscle damage and really inhibits your, your visualization. So you can do a soft tissue release or an osteotomy of the ASIS to improve the exposure of the lateral window. And I actually think it helps to protect the lateral femicutaneous nerve because the lateral femicutaneous nerve here is going to move with sartorius that you leave attached to the ASIS along with an external oblique. So you have a digastric osteotomy of the ASIS, but it helps to move the lateral femicutaneous nerve here. You see there's the osteotomy being performed and then that all moves with the osteotomy. So perhaps that helps to protect the lateral from a cutaneous nerve and while simultaneously improving your exposure through the lateral window and the internal iliac fossa and the sacroiliac joint if need be. So again, the indications are the same. Uh, I would say, you know, another question uh, about the AIP is what about hernia mesh? The only time that I think a hernia repair remotely is going to affect your ability to do the AIP is if they've put mesh across the midline, intrapelvic. So they've done something maybe like an AIP or laparoscopically, but if they have mesh all the way across the midline, then it's, it's really hard, if not impossible, to do this approach. If it's a unilateral repair where mesh has been placed unilaterally and it does not cross the midline, usually it's not a problem at all to do the AIP. Okay. However, having said that, if you want to go ahead and compare iliolingual to AIP, reducing fractures, the philosophy and the order that you do things is pretty much exactly the same. It should be no different. And it, you know, really what it comes down to is you start in the anterior column cranially and you work your way down the anterior column caudally and you then once you stabilize the anterior column back to the constant iliac fragment that's attached to the axial skeleton, then you reduce the posterior column and you put your posterior column fixation in. Whether you're doing an AIP or iliolingual, the philosophy is the same. All right. Now, one thing I want to just talk about a little bit is clamp opportunities through the AIP because that's where people sometimes get a little confused because the trajectory is different. All right, the easy parts are when the quadrilateral surface and the posterior column are together and you can use the quadrilateral surface as a point of fixation for your tines. And you can imagine through the AIP that this is a pretty uh, simple way to do it where you're just coming along and, and attaching to the quadrilateral surface and over the brim like that, right? Now, that, now that's fairly straightforward depending on where the fracture line is exiting in the posterior column. And if now you have, uh, let's say, dissociation of the quadrilateral surface from the posterior column, but you can't use the quadrilateral surface to indirect or, you know, to, uh, as a manipulator of the posterior column. So now you have to move to the posterior column itself. If the fracture line is proximal enough, then you can get into the greater sciatic notch here and use the greater sciatic notch and the posterior cortex of the posterior column to bring the posterior column up to the anterior column like that. Okay, so this is what it would look like interoperatively. Now, here's a caveat, here's something you have to remember. Remember that the hip is flexed. So if you're gonna start putting reduction clamps or retractors into the greater sciatic notch and foramen, you gotta remember that with the hip being flexed, the sciatic nerve is under more tension. You have to worry about the superior gluteal vessels as well too but don't forget about the sciatic nerve. You don't wanna start banging on the sciatic nerve because it is under more tension when the hip is flexed and through anterior approaches and 
George Heidekevich wrote a paper on injuries to the sciatic nerve from, from anterior approaches, and they happen because you forget about that, all right? But that clamp placement is possible if this fracture line is high up near the greater sciatic notch. And it would look like that. Remember, the obturator nerve that you've freed up and mobilized is going to run between the two ends of those tines when you're doing that. If the fracture line is very distal in the posterior column down towards the ischial spine, which tends to be more typical, particularly with transverse fractures, if you're going to do a transverse fracture from the anterior, well, this gets a little harder and you have to be comfortable exposing down to the ischial spine so that you can use the ischial spine as a point of contact for the, the uh, posterior column reduction. And so this is a clamp from anterior that's placed very distal right down into the ischial spine and into the obturator foramen distally like this picture right here. You just have to be comfortable exposing that distal down to the posterior column. And I'm sure that uh, a lot of you are familiar with the collinear reduction clamp. This, you can't place this through an AIP. You can place it through a pararectus approach like uh, Marius Kiel talks about but you can't place this clamp through an AIP. So if you're gonna do an AIP and you wanna use the collinear reduction clamp, well then you'd have to open up the lateral window or some variant or you know, do a, a part of the inguinal approach to get that clamp in there, all right? Now, what about this fragment here? So we've talked about the anterior column and the posterior column. Occasionally, you'll, with an associated both column fracture, you'll have this tension failure of the posterior superior wall. And how do you get at that through the AIP? Well, you need the lateral window to get at that. And, and we'll talk about that because remember, you're going to have to have the anterior column and the posterior column reduced. And the question is, is do you go after that posterior superior fragment before or after you have the posterior column reduced? And does that impair your ability to reduce that fragment? Like in other words, you don't want to block yourself from reducing that posterior superior fragment. So here we have the anterior column reduced, and we have a clamp that's kind of temporarily doing that. We have K-wires that are helping to maintain the reduction of the anterior column, and here's that piece. So I like to, I like to try to get after it before I have my definitive fixation in the posterior column because I don't want to inadvertently block myself from being able to reduce this fragment. To get at that fragment, you use the lateral window and dissect out along the anterior core or the outer cortex from the anterior approach. And this is with an osteotomy of the AIIS. So you can see the lateral femicutaneous nerve and sartorius over here with the osteotomy fragment. And that allows you to get out onto the outer table, reduce that fragment, and then put fixation into it from the intrapelvic approach right here, right above the joint and the second point of fixation there for that fragment. Finally, uh, what about stabilizing the posterior column? Well, your options generally speaking are lag screws and plates like any other approach. You can plate the posterior column from inside the pelvis if the fracture line is proximal or cranial enough in the posterior column. But you have to make sure it's cranial enough. If the fracture line is very distal down here by the ischial spine, you obviously can't plate it from inside the pelvis. All right, but if it's cranial enough, you can plate medial surface of the posterior column. Here's the posterior column fracture line. Here's a lag screw for that one a little cortical segment in the brim. That's right here. And then there's the plate that comes down the medial surface of the posterior column. One caveat to plating the medial surface of the posterior column is you, if you compress here, you have to make sure on your x-rays that you're not gapping the posterior rim farther out laterally. So you don't want it to compress medially and gap laterally. So just be careful that you're not uh, causing a gap on the far cortex or at the posterior rim if you decide to plate the medial surface of the posterior column like that. And here's another example of plating the posterior column from within the AIP. And this can all be placed from the AIP approach. More standard would be posterior column lag screws. Careful you don't have these gaps in the posterior column. You know, I, I think it's, you want to try to get your posterior column screws as close as you can 
to the articular surface. Like try to put a couple of points of fixation if you're gonna you know, hang the whole posterior column off just lag screws. But these are placed through the lateral window. You can't place posterior column lag screws through the AIP. You have to open up the lateral window. And just be mindful of these gaps. If you have a little gap, you have to redo the clamp. If you compress close to the joint, then near the notch, you get this gap, then you have to adjust that, take your screw out, recompress and re-reduce the posterior column near the notch, and then put your posterior column screws back in, okay, with that clamp reduced near and near for the posterior column. Quadrilateral surface buttress plates are really nice from the AIP approach. You have the trajectory for all of these screws as possible, and they all go into the posterior column into the retroacetabular bone. It's actually really hard to put a screw in here into the joint because you just don't have the trajectory to do it. So they all do nicely go into the posterior column. Infrapectineal plating, this is what Cole and Ballhofer described uh, and another subsequent uh, publication by Qureshi, uh, which is really nice from the infrapectineal approach where you start with a screw just lateral to the sacroiliac joint and have an infrapectineal buttress plate for the quadrilateral surface if need be. So quadrilateral surface and dome impaction. Does everybody who's got comminution of the quadrilateral surface need to have a quadrilateral surface buttress plate? And the answer to that question is no. If your anterior column and your posterior column are anatomically reduced and stable, Combination of the quadrilateral surface does not always beget a quadrilateral surface buttress plate. However, if the comminution along the quadrilateral surface extends above the brim, and if you have anterior and posterior column reduced, the femoral head can then still come into the pelvis. So in those scenarios where that comminution and fracture of the quadrilateral surface extend up over the brim, that's when you want to consider buttressing the quadrilateral surface, all right? And and the dome impaction that sometimes goes along with this is also something I think that is nice to get through the AIP. But you have to have your, your philosophy figured out because are you going to be someone that reduces the dome impaction through the fracture, i.e. the anterior and posterior columns are not yet reduced? So you're not 100% sure that the femoral head is sitting in the right place in three-dimensional space. or do you reduce the anterior and posterior columns first, get the femoral head in the right position in three-dimensional space, and then reduce the dome impaction to that? But now the columns are reduced, the fracture line is not open. So that means that you need to make some kind of a uh, cortical window like this, lateral to the plate, and try to find that impacted segment and lever it down with an osteotome here to bring it down to reduce that. But that's trickier because sometimes it's hard to localize that fragment because now you're doing it radiographically rather than through the fracture and looking directly at it. But here you can see that we managed to reduce that dome impaction and then place a rafter screw, hopefully, above that to help support it and maintain the reduction of that, uh, of that fragment there. I just want to conclude that, uh, you know, because people like to compare and contrast and say, which one's better, which one's better. Uh, you know, I, my belief is that they're not, one is not better than the other. I think you need to know both approaches. All in all, all things considered, when the dust settles and at the end of the day, the anatomic reduction is the responsibility of the surgeon, not the approach. And, uh, you know, if you can get an anatomic reduction through the AIP, then great, or the pararectus, then great, then use it. If you can't and you're better with the alien winguinal, then use the alien winguinal for crying out loud. Um, maybe the one, the one nice thing about the AIP is that the surgical time and the amount of time it takes to close it, especially for some of these geriatric patients, maybe it's a little bit lighter. Maybe, maybe the, the blood supply is a little, uh, sorry, the blood loss is a little bit less. But honestly, you know, the, your ability to reduce it, if you know what you're doing and you follow the principles, the, the, the two approaches, I think, are equal and they shouldn't be really compared and contrasted and, uh, and you shouldn't uh, think really necessarily one is better unless one is better in your own personal hands. So having said that, I'm done. Take any questions. <laughs>
Thanks, Claude. Um, so what, one uh, question that uh, comes up, well, obviously we're, we'll be talking about reduction and fixation of the various different anterior fracture patterns more next week, um, but uh, is it possible or is it safe uh, to reduce uh, SI joint widening from the AIP approach? Yeah, so I mean, you can see the sacroiliac joint, and a couple people have uh, um, done it. I know, and I, I I've gone at it and put a clamp on the anterior aspect. Uh, Corey Collins has shown me a couple pictures, uh, and I know he's he's talked about doing a like putting a ferrobuff, let's say, on the anterior aspect of the sacral ala and then into the uh, into the ilium, and reducing the SI joint from the AIP purely uh, without using a lateral window. So I, I, I mean, it's definitely possible. Uh, before you do it, here's what I suggest you do. I suggest you go onto a cadaver and then do it through the AIP approach, put the screws in, put the Ferrobuff clamp on there, and then leave it there and then open the lateral window and dissect out the external iliac, the internal iliac, the superior gluteal, and the L5 nerve root, and see where they are in relation to the Ferrobuff clamp, and see how big vessels you've got there. And uh, I think you can do it for sure. You got to be very careful because if you get a vessel back there, then you're going to have a lot of trouble. You're going to have a bad day. And I'm not, I'm not advocating for or against it. I'm just saying. You got to know that anatomy, and I would say do it on a cadaver. See what you're actually dealing with, because the problem when you do the AIP is you're kind of doing it blindly, and what you don't, you know, what you don't know, what you don't know, right? That's the whole Donald Rumsfeld thing, and you know, you, you take a look and see what you are near to, because it will it'll open your eyes, and it may th make you think, you know what? I'll just open the lateral window instead. Uh, because it's a little safer and a little easier for me to do that. What uh, so uh, what we want to remind you of then is the the homework assignment for but uh, before next week would be to review the surgical approaches uh, and surgical approach videos for the ilioinguinal approach and for the AIP approach uh, are uploaded to the um, AO Trauma North America YouTube channel along with the um, surgical approach for the extended iliofemoral approach. Wasn't spoken of a lot uh, in this particular section, but, um, but it was mentioned. And so uh, we're including that link as well. If you wanna take a quick screenshot here of the uh, direct link uh, there for the, the homework assignments, go ahead. But um, you will, why is that? There you go. Uh, you will receive an email uh, to all registered um, uh, participants uh, within 24 hours, sending you um, directly to the uh, to the homework. Uh, the homework from previous um, sessions is also there as well, and so you can find all of that on the AO Trauma North America YouTube channel. Uh, next week, we continue with acetabular fracture evaluation and treatment, moving into reduction of fixation of uh, the uh, anterior-based uh, fracture patterns. Uh, and so we hope you'll be able to, to join us. As we mentioned last week, uh, an additional session was added in um, uh, for more case discussion. And so this is a new session. It's uh, on a Thursday evening of August 27th, uh, Thursday evening, sorry, East Coast time, um, uh, on August 27th, and it will require a separate registration link. This will be sent out to everybody to, uh, to register, uh, but you can also screenshot the registration link here, and that will be to discuss uh, some uh, more complex uh, cases, combined uh, uh, pelvic and acetabular cases. So I wanna thank you all very much for uh, joining us today. Uh, sorry about running over a little bit. We do have the standard evaluation questions, please, to, uh, to answer for us. Um, and then uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day or evening. Uh, and weekend, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing all of you or hearing all of you or seeing your names anyway uh, next week when we continue with the course. Thank you so much.